you have trained a machine learning model? Great. And how many of you got the opportunity to deploy the model in real life environment or in the process of deploying one at the moment? Great, so you come to the right uh, talk. So a little bit about myself. My name is Moran Chacham, and I'm a data scientist at Spark Beyond. I, I'm working on a variety of use cases from finance, retail, and many more. And I had the opportunity to take part in four deployment projects, ranging from small startups to big enterprises. Well, they say data is the new oil, and sometimes just the vast amount of data can make it hard to see the forests through the trees. This is why we say data is the new crude oil, meaning you need to know how to use your data in order to get your or organization from A to B. So if data is the new crude oil, uh, it means you need to take it through a distillation process before you can effectively use it. So what is this process? Um, CRISPDM is a well-known methodology of an, uh, managing your analytical uh, projects, starting from the business understanding, detailing all the research steps, and ending with one word, the deployment. Well, in reality, things don't really end up in deployment. And today I'm going to talk about this rarely talked subject of deploying a machine learning models uh, using a case study uh, as an example to demonstrate all, the, all of the steps. Um, the path to a successful project goes through a successful deployment, which brings me to, to the motivation. Uh, the sad truth is, according to Sloan MIT, only 6% of AI projects will successfully reach the deployment stage. This means that the rest will just fall short. So why do so many AI projects fail? There are many reasons. It can be that the POC is not delivering the expected results. It can be just lack of data, costs that are running too high, or just a disconnect between the business and the data scientist, just to name a few. So if you really want to succeed in this process of deploying your machine learning model, you need to be crossing uh, three chasms. First is the business. You need to prove the business value of your use case. Second is the operations. This is basically the long technical process of migrating your models from a research environment to a production environment. And supplying scores on live data in real time. And lastly, and, not, and uh, most important, is the materiality. You can think of this step as sort of closing the loop. This means that you're actually taking these predictions that you created, translating, in, translating them into business actions, and actually starting to produce revenue, actually returning the investment on these projects. Um, so to demonstrate this, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a case study that I, that I took part in. Uh, it was a world-leading shipping company who wanted to basically uh, forecast their demands for all the products in order to minimize unused shipping capacity and improve their uh, revenue. You can think of shipping capacity as perishable inventory. Essentially, that means that once the shipment uh, is uh, exited, you cannot sell this inventory and it's dead. You, this is a loss of income. So although the, uh, this company collected a lot of data on their operational uh, conduct day to day, they were still unclear what are the drivers that are affecting their demand, increasing it up or down. Our main mission was to build and train a suit of models predicting the demand for all their product lines. Um, and uh, replacing costly manual predictions. So let's start with the business understanding. We've all been there, right? Standing in, in, in front of execs and uh, realizing that they're expecting magic, thinking that data science is a money printing machine. Well, uh, it's not uh, so easy. 
While execs don't really need to understand the technicalities of your model, they do need to understand how machine learning is learning from data, how it can be applied, and how it can help them, in, especially in the context of decision support system. So uh, for us, we needed to provide forecasts for over 200 uh, products, and we set up, we started by basically closing this expectations gap by basing three uh, guidelines to the execs. The first is that not all your products are equal. This means that the demand for each product can be more or less stable, can have higher or low variance, and this is directly affecting our ability to predict the demand. We cannot predict the demand for all the products at the same level of accuracy. The second pillar is basically that our models are studying, are learning from statistics and learning from the past, which means that our model will not predict in the future an event that I haven't seen before in the past. And last and a very important one is that we evaluate models on average. In this case, we used root mean squared error as a, an evaluation matrix and we provided the uh, average error, not the maximal error, which is uh, a gap. Uh, to quote George Box, so all models are wrong, but some are useful, and we need to remind them of that. Computers and models sometimes uh, make mistakes. Uh, when we talk about business understanding, we need to understand that it goes both ways. Also, us, the data scientists, needs to under need to understand our clients and our users. We started by asking them, what do you want this demand forecasting for? Or essentially asking, who is the end client? We talked to two departments. The first was the pricing. For them, they wanted the high resolution of demand. They didn't really care about the container type, so what was actually the shipment contained. But they wanted the demand a long time before uh, the date, so one month ahead at least. When we talked to the logistics, they wanted a much finer resolution. They cared about the type of the container, they cared about what's inside uh, and, the, and the type of materials, and they were fine with getting the predictions only one week before the shipment. So if, thanks to talking to them, we understood that what target we need to create, what is the time horizon, and what is the resolution of our models. So once we reached this business understanding, we uh, launched a, a POC, a proof of concept. The POC itself can vary from domain to domain. For our purposes, the POC needed to prove uh, basically that you can uh, predict the demand using a machine learning model in a way that is uh, useful to the business. Uh, this POC lasted for three months. We uh, did a two week long sprint, so overall seven sprints. We used six different uh, data sources incorporated into our models and we uh, trained two or 20 par parallel models to uh, supply the predictions for a smaller set of products just for the POC. Our main effort in this stage was basically to uh, improve our predictions, optimize the model, clean the data, and uh, do a lot of feature engineering. Um, you might expect at the POC stage that your users are being involved and give you a lot of feedback. It might not necessarily be the case. So in order to uh, get this feedback and uh, get them involved, uh, we, we focused on the end product and not our predictive model. This meant that we actually sat with the end users, explained to them the logic behind the model, why the model is predicting A or B, and when on which scenarios the model will have a higher error or lower error. We use that by uh, giving different charts, uh, what if analysis and variable importance. And by doing this, we ensure the user's involvement in, in this uh, early stage. Uh, what ha it helped us a lot because we realized, thanks to them, that uh, one major driver for the demand is actually the currency exchange rates uh, and we actually added this as an additional data source to our models. Um, 
Once we have uh, finished the POC stage, we got the buying of all the major execs, and now we transfer to the pilot stage where we need to prove the value to the actual end user. So how do you do this transition from POC to pilot, and um, what's actually the difference? So in a POC, the outcome is essentially a machine learning model. You train it based normally on a static training set and validation set. In a pilot, you're actually creating an MVP or a prototype. In this case, we created a dashboard, and you're actually predicting on live data. The goal of the POC is to prove the statistical uh, predictiveness of the model, meaning that can I actually predict the demand accurately enough? But at the pilot stage, you are testing the value to the business. This means, can I actually translate from predictions to business actions that will yield something? For example, to minimize the logistics cost. And lastly, a POC is enjoying the illusion of average. This means that we are presenting the average accuracy of the model. Um, that can be a little bit misleading because the average score can be really good, but the variance of the errors can range so wide, making the models useless as a decision support system. While a pilot suffers from a first impression bias, meaning that your end user sees only a handful of predictions that might be misrepresenting the overall performance of your model in the long run. Uh, our pilot, we listed, in our pilot, we listed two uh, product managers uh, that gave us feedback on a day-to-day. -day. We created a script for them to uh, score models on fresh data. This is a screenshot of the actual live dashboard that we used, and we collected, collected daily feedback from them. Uh, one, this uh, dashboard forced our users to develop the new skill of actually translating uh, predictions with a level of uncertainty to actions, and they quickly realized that for pricing actions, they need more than one month ahead of prediction, and we expanded the predictions to two months ahead, giving them uh, new actions they can take business-wise. For example, they can sign short-term contracts with their client and improve their revenue. So key takeaways here is listen to your users. Thanks to that, we expanded our prediction horizon for one month to two, and also to reinforce uh, known business rules. This means that it can be sometimes confusing to a user to get a prediction that contradicts his known business, you know, his non-business uh, rules. So, a make sure that you test your model outcome to the non-business rules in this organization, and b what we did, we ad added explanations to our predictions to allow the user to resolve this conflict when it rises. So, once you have crossed this first chasm and uh, finish with the pilot, you can go out to the operations, which consists of deployment and integration. This is essentially the process of moving your uh, models from research to uh, production environment. I will uh, list here in detail the environment that we created and kind of uh, highlight the main takeaways. So we started with a research server that was enough for us for the pilot and POC stages. We added then a production environment with an inference server. So essentially, we exported the logic of all the models from the research environment to the inference server. This server is actually waiting for a request, and upon request, it will score all the rows of data and uh, basically return the prediction. We created a, an ETL service to collect all the data from all the data sources, wrap it up, in a JSON and then communicate with this inference server in a simple REST API protocol similar to Azure and other solutions. Uh, once we have that, uh, the full process uh, looks like this. Um, we had a daily batch service taking all the fresh data, sending it to the inference server for scoring. The scores were then saved back into a database, waiting for a request from any application or service to return these uh, scores on demand. And in parallel, we had, for example, a dashboard that when the user is, an, is entering the dashboard, this request is uh, being sent and the data is fetched from the database and populates the report. 
uh, for to actually accommodate the request, we needed to deploy over 1,000 models to cover all the product line for this uh, client. And we quickly realized that we needed a way to monitor because it's a lot of models. So we actually had a, a monitoring uh, service that actually checks all the 1,000 models live and alerting us to models that are not be behaving as expected. Once a model is not behaving as expected, uh, we might need to retrain the model. For this, we had another script, essentially using the same ETL process, kept getting the latest data that we have and retraining this model. Now there is a, a line to export back from research to inference. Uh, also there, we had to compare the old performance to the new performance, but also the stability of the predictions in order to make sure that we're not exporting a new model that is inferior to what we had already live in production. So key takeaways from the deployment stage is firstly, remember that data scientists are typically not IT experts. That means that in order to implement all of this deployment schema, you are reliant on other people with other work queues and other priorities. Second is data manipulation. So we have all used uh, data manipulations and feature engineering um, extensively to increase model performance. Uh, you have to remember to deploy all of the data pipeline to, pro to the production environment. For example, if you took null values and imputed them with the mean value, you need to make sure that you export this mean value with your model to the production environment so that your that new rows of information will impute in the same way and uh, your models will not be hurt. And uh, integration goes hand in hand with deployment. So key takeaways from that, uh, starting with the ETL, uh, we, expect, we expected like an agile ETL process with the client, meaning that whenever our research updated, when we wanted to add a new data source, we could update the ETL. Uh, it was not the case. It turns out that adding uh, to their ETL process uh, another data source was more painful and costly than expected. So be mindful to that before you start and understand the constraints before you start this process. Uh, the second is data sources and data changes. So data, change, data can change over time. And you need to uh, check the data that you're inputting into the production environment and make sure, for example, for a categorical column that you're not introducing a new label that was not seen in the training uh, and other uh, things like that. Once you've succeeded the operations, yay, successful, you, you have a live uh, model in production, your users can use it all the time, they can start consuming the predictions. However, uh, you need to cross the final chasm, which is materiality. And this might be the most important one of all. So if you take just one thing, remember this last one. Uh, you might uh, make sure your users actually use it. In order to achieve that, you, you need uh, adoption of the users. So don't forget uh, the user element. If you want people to consume your model outputs, don't expect the data to speak for itself. Th your, the users need to trust you as a data scientist and that you did a good enough job. This starts with uh, a lot of feedback from them and also explaining them, as I said in the beginning, the logic behind the model. The second is the model refresh. So as I said earlier, we uh, need to retrain the model over time uh, due to degradation, and we need to monitor the changes between the old version and the new version and mitigate it to our users in a way that will not confuse them because it can be confusing to get a, a prediction of 100 yesterday and today 200, and you, it's not really understandable to the user what is the difference there. And lastly, uh, we're not trying to predict the future, we're actually trying to change it. This means that if, my, uh, predict, if I predicted last month that the demand for a product will be low and this uh, product owner actually took action, talked to their sales team and they delivered and the, the shipment was actually strong and the demand was high, this means that we were, was the model wrong or that we actually succeeded in triggering the, the desired outcome. So when you're monitoring these live models in performance, make sure you're not punishing the models for triggering the desired action. 
And these, what are these actions? So uh, translating demand forecasts into business actions is not as straightforward as you might have thought. From the beginning, before the POC, we've actually sat with the end users and listed what potential actions they can take using these predictions. We split it to two time horizon, two months ahead and one month ahead. Uh, what we had here is actually signing contracts with uh, their clients, uh, basically trading capacity uh, with their partners, changing the pricing up and down to increase or uh, reduce demand. And for the shorter time horizon, managing the empty slots and optimizing logistical costs. To wrap up, it can be difficult to deploy a predictive uh, model in production. You need to make sure you fully understand the intricacies of the organization and of your case, of your use case, in order to make sure that you're training the right model at the right resolution with the right target and the right time horizon. Remember to listen to your users. Make sure you deploy the entire data pipeline, no shortcuts and no assumptions. And don't forget to communicate with the users and win their trust if you want them to actually use it. Thank you.